Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive with Dr. Rebecca Risk. Do you ever feel that even though nothing seems seriously wrong and you pass all the medical tests, that you still feel that your health, pain, and fatigue are completely out of control? It doesn't have to be that way. Listen to the tips and suggestions given on our program today and take back control of your health. Now, here is Dr. Rebecca Risk. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Falling Through the Cracks. Today, we're talking with Nicholas Pinot. He is an investigative health journalist, educator, and advocate for safe technologies. Today, we're discussing his book, The Tin- Non-Tinfoil Guide to EMFs. So, Nick, welcome to the show. Well, uh, Rebecca, thanks so much for having me. My pleasure. Um, so, what inspired you to, to put this book together? Sure. Well, I, I had been researching about mainly the food industry for several years as an investigative health journalist about the the nonsense that sometimes we discover. For example, some of the 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 wild salmon that is sold throughout uh, U.S. restaurants is in fact uh, farmed sal- salmon, and these kind of these kind of facts just made my my blood boil, and I wanted to share it with. Uh, my my listeners, my readers throughout the world that I gathered over the years. And when I stumbled upon the, the topic of EMS, and that's electromagnetic field emitted by our modern technologies like Wi-Fi routers or Bluetooth thingies or cell phones, uh, I just discovered something that shocked me to the very core, and that's that these things are, aren't as safe as we previously thought that they were. Well, it, I mean, most people think they they are safe. Um, I found a little bit of irony in the fact that you sent me a PDF version of your book, and I had to read it on my laptop. <laughs> and and as I'm reading your book, and your my laptop sitting on my lap, I was like, oh dear. <laughs> so you know, it, yeah. it, I I knew that there's issues, but it was it just kind of made me a little paranoid at the time that that uh, I'm reading all this information and exposing sure. myself. Um, but um, if you can just tell our listeners. Mm-hmm. What, what we're talking about with, with EMFs. Like, what is that? Sure. So EMF, again, electromagnetic field. So these are the wireless signals that we've been using for, um, it, well, I mean, electricity is a type of EMF that we've been using for now uh, over 100 years in certain parts of the world. But when it comes to these wireless signals, especially Wi-Fi and smartphones, it's a brand new technology. And this is these are electromagnetic fields that our biology has basically never been exposed to in this form, at as, as this frequency, because in nature... There's an entire spectrum of things that are electromagnetic. For example, sun radiation, right? Even the visible light and also the invisible light, whether it's infrared, we we feel the heat, but we don't see certain uh, wavelengths of infrared. And there's also UV radiation. That's a natural EMF. And we know that UV radiation, well, it can increase your cancer risk if if you get burned. But if you get just enough, there are such things as incredible benefits from the sun because of the vitamin D productive uh, effect on your skin. And it's uh, it's, uh, related uh, immune boosting properties and cancer fighting properties. So in nature, we were exposed. We always have been exposed to different uh, types of EMFs. The difference is that now we're using uh, new EMFs, let's say man-made frequencies, that uh, our biology is not accustomed to, and our, uh, it, it looks like there are consequences to that. If even if uh, when we first roll out this this technology, uh, most scientists and regulators thought that uh, they were per- perfectly safe, which is not the case. Well, so I mean, in my lifetime, um, I actually turned forty this week. Yeah, I have seen things changed dramatically. I mean, I didn't even have internet mm-hmm. growing up. And then we had dial up, which was quite a challenge. And now not only do we have a faster internet, it is everywhere. I mean, it's not just you sit down at your home computer and take turns on it. Like when I was a kid and or uh, I was actually an adult when we got internet in our house. Um, but we have our phones. So, so it is everywhere. Um, and and that, that has happened very, very quickly. That, that's a short period of time where we're exposed to this all the time in a way that we never have been before. That's right. And our exposure right now, and I I might have written that in the book, but the, the latest figures that I got from independent scientists is that 
uh, our exposure, even the exposure that I'm getting in Montreal, even <laughs> if I don't use Wi-Fi personally, that's the choice I've taken trying to uh, walk my talk, of course, and reduce my EMF exposure. So I work on Ethernet, but even the, even that considered, I'm exposed to, let's say, a, a, a layer of electro smog, of, of, of electro pollution from the city that's the equivalent of about a quintillion times higher exposure than in 1920s. So a quintillion, for those who aren't <laughs> familiar with such high numbers, is one billion billions times more exposure than in the 1920s before uh, around World War One. So it, it, it is tremendous, the exposure that our biology is experiencing. Then it, it, it doesn't mean necessarily that it's a problem. Uh, if it's safe, if, if, if it has no effect like the industry and a lot of people and even in the medical community think, uh, well, these signals are maybe ubiquitous, but uh, good news, there's no effect. And I wish it were the case, but unfortunately, that's not what my research shows. And my research is, of course, I'm, I'm a journalist. I'm just reporting on, on the hundreds, if not thousands, of independent scientists that are, that are claiming that. Well, so th this is something that I think a lot of people will just say, you know, is um, I think there's a reason why your book is called The Non-Tinfoil Guide, because anybody <laughs> yeah. who talks about EMF or um, EMF sensitivity or electrosensitivity, you know, they're, they're not treated very well, especially if they go to their doctor and say, this is making me sick. It's not really accepted right. that this is an issue. And so why do you think it is that, that we're disagreeing so much? Um, well, the main problem is that physicists um, who are looking at the issue, especially e engineers from the industry, the EMF engineer, are, are claiming that the only effect we should look at when it comes to safety standards is the heating effect. So in other words, uh, just, just to, to be clear, the, the signals that we use for cell phones and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, this is the same frequency as a microwave oven. So this is essentially microwave radiation. But, uh, of course, your cell phone cannot cook your head or else, or else all the users would be dead by now or damaged. And obviously, we, we wouldn't have uh, continued with this technology. It is very low power compared to a microwave oven. But the question is, um, uh, when it comes to the, the, the safety, they decided to set the standards around the fact that if your cell phone cannot increase the temperature of your brain by more than two Celsius, then it's safe. So it's a matter of heating. So of course, if you overheat the brain, you might have all sorts of effects. Uh, and if you don't heat it, there's no problem. But that's, unfortunately, that's not accurate because it, it looks like the, the latest scientific data, even going back decades from the military in the 1970s and even uh, the, the NASA in the 1970s, showed that there are such things as non-thermal effect. So in other words, even if you, uh, your body isn't being heated by your, by your cell phone, even if it's below this the quote-unquote safety limits, it, it can still cause, for example, oxidative stress in your cells. And we know that uh, over time, these end up uh, creating a downstream of biological effects like DNA damage. Uh, and DNA damage that needs to repair will uh, therefore uh, drain your cellular energy. So mitochondrial dysfunction. So the, it, it's not that much the, the acute effect of the technology, like getting a burn or, or increasing temperature in your tissues. It's more the, the long-term effect of oxidative damage uh, that is essentially uh, an increased cellular stress. So the main problem resides in this argument, is, is there such thing as non-thermal effects? And the, the bizarre thing um, in, in my findings is that, well, <laughs> there are literally thousands of studies on, on, on all levels studying organs, studying uh, in vitro, in vivos, in, in animals, in plants, in humans, that do show that these non-thermal effects are real and are happening at levels, uh, magnitudes uh, lower uh, when it comes to EMF compared to what we're exposed to. So I don't even know why there's still an argument. I think that the industry uh, is trying to keep this myth uh, going that there's not, no such thing as thermal, uh, as the non-thermal effects in order to keep bi doing business as usual. Because if we recognize the non-thermal effects, then we'll need to reduce exposure. And who says reduce exposure says we need to... Uh, basically change every cell phone out there 
uh, reduce the amount of technology that we use for the moment, and this is not good business. This is the the opposite of of progress in in, in the head of uh, people who are uh, profit driven, basically. Well, and I, I think it, it, although I definitely agree that that's always a factor, pro- the profits when we come into it, into something like this where, you know, what do we do? Um, but I, I think there's also another aspect of it. It has become a way of life for almost everybody now. Yeah. And um, it would, it it would be very difficult to change that now because we're so used to having our email on the go and our phone on the go. And, and um, I, I mean, I, I got rid of my landline many, many years ago when I was in school mm-hmm. as a as a budget thing, and it was just more convenient to have a cell phone. And I don't think I'm alone in that. So for us to to change, um, I think it would be the technology that has to become safer. Um, that yeah. I, that that to me, that's the only thing that that could happen. And you know, there should be a, a movement towards that. I, I totally agree. Uh, users should not have the responsibility to uh, use their so, their cell phone differently. You know, I, I don't think it's a responsible thing for uh, for the government or companies or anyone to to claim. Well, users should just change their habits if they're uh, afraid that their cell phone might increase cancer risk. Uh, users are not going to do that. Mainly, we should change technology, and it, it's not about uh, stop using wireless altogether. Uh, I think it, it's really a matter of, for example, changing where we place cell phone towers, uh, removing cell phone towers that are right next to where people live and having them be a little bit more in the vicinity of cities like like they've done in several countries, by the way. So a lot of countries outside the U.S. and, and Canada also, I'm a, I'm a, I must say, is pretty behind on that. But they've taken action and they've actively put regulations in place to reduce exposure in their, in their most sensitive populations. For example, you, you do not see, uh, well, in India, they, they've banned the installation of uh, cell phone towers on top of hospital buildings, near playgrounds, uh, near nurseries, near kindergartens, and it just makes sense. It's, these are, this is caution. This is uh, following the precautionary principle, which says that uh, in the face of scientific uncertainty, we should act with caution instead of doing the opposite, like we're doing right now in the U.S. and Canada and other countries, which is, well, in the face of uncertainty, maybe it's a carcinogen, maybe it's not. Let's increase the levels. <laughs> so it, it's, just, it's just a matter of uh, taking a stand as a, as a society and imposing uh, more strict laws. And then in India, they, already, they, they, they still have the signals in France. Where, where they have banned uh, Wi-Fi in nurseries and kindergarten, they still have Wi-Fi around. It's just that they don't expose children as much uh, because of the emerging research on what they can do to brain function and, and, and growing brains. Well, is, so I want to get into that a little bit more, um, but mm-hmm. but not quite yet. I, I want to talk about okay. um, ju- just where... It, it, so what what are the regulations set um, in in North America? So you're saying that we're just not acknowledging it? Are there any safety standards at all? There are. Uh, the safety standards are ba- are based on heating. So it means that you're you can be exposed to up to it's it's around sixty volts per meter, uh, which is which is a tremendous exposure. Uh, you would be hard pressed to even find a device or even a cell phone tower that would expose you to such levels. So in other words, anything goes in North America because, again, this is based on, on heating and there's basically no device that are going to increase your, your, uh, your tissue um, temperature by that much. So they're not looking at really what is the, the lowest safety levels. And it's, it's all based on the false premise that, that only heating effects matter. So when they install new cell phone towers and it's right next to habitants, uh, right on a, an apartment building or uh, near a school or, I mean, a, a Wi-Fi router in school is so common, even the industrial strength stuff. Uh, it, it's based on the false premise that only heat matters. And when they take measurements, they're happy to report that it's a fraction of what the safety limits are. So there, there are regulations in place. It's just that, again, they're based on a false myth perpetuated by the industry. And the longer we, we maintain this myth, uh, the more we're going to continue um, having this false sense of, of security, basically. 
Well, it doesn't make sense to me. Is this industry self-regulating itself? Because usually don't we have a, a, our government that will set the, the standards without being yeah. um, involved. So it sounds to me from what you just said that, that it's that's not the case. Um, it, it is. So the, the FCC, Federal Communication Commission in the U.S., is responsible for that. You have Cal Canada and their Safety Code 6 in Canada. Uh, these are the guidelines, and, and they, they are relying on mainly information from uh, the International Commission on uh, Non-Ionizing um, Protection, uh, Radiation Protection, or CNIP. And this ERCNIP is... Uh, doesn't seem to acknowledge uh, these 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 non-thermal effects, and uh, at the moment there's a lot of um, independent scientists worldwide who are uh, really trying to change that to make them aware that uh, that the, these non-thermal effects are are occurring. But this group is. Uh, strongly influenced in, in the case cer- certain scientists are claiming it's strongly influenced by the industry. So the, the industry, it looks just like it happened with so many industries, has a strong grasp, a strong influence on where the science is going. And one of the things that they're actively trying to do is to publish no effect studies uh, to, to make, to create this doubt in research, some, uh, a technique that has been used by big tobacco, by, uh, big pharma and by the food industry when trying to, to manufacture doubt. And the regulators after that are looking at ERCNIP or looking at, uh, the, the entire amount of day da- of data. And if it's 50% of studies say no, 50% say yes. Well, their conclusion is that, well, we will not change standards because the studies so far are inconclusive, right? But is that true? It, it's, um, it's a matter of a scientific debate at the moment. Uh, but in certain countries, you know, and that's the important part, that's my, my entire message is that in certain countries like France, like the island of Cyprus, like India that I've mentioned, like Spain, like China, Russia, I mean, several dozen, dozen countries are taking action in reducing doing following this precautionary principle, reducing the exposure of their populations, uh, even while looking at the exact same data as the FCC or Health Canada. So how, how come? Uh, I don't think that their science is more uh, paranoiac or, or that they, they, they don't use a science-based approach. I think it's a matter of uh, how, um, how they do risk management. And uh, I think in North America, we're a little bit re- reckless when it comes to rolling out these technologies and the U.S. adopting the 5G network, the next generation of, of signals that are, are going to require thousands and, and millions of new antennas near uh, where people live. And, and their argument is that we need to win the race to 5G. It's an argument that's an economic one. It's not a, it's not a, a, a safety one. So it, it's always... Well, the market will regulate itself eventually, but the problem is that uh, right now DDMFs are a class 2B carcinogen, you know, but uh, independent researchers that have looked at this classification in 2011, several of them, in the, if not the majority that are still active, are saying it should be a class 2A or a class 1 carcinogen. And if that's true, it means that definitely our safety standards are not right because this cancer is occurring at levels, orders of magnitudes below the safety standards. Okay. Um, we're going to take a quick break. We're talking today with Nicholas Pinot. And we're discussing his book, The Non-Tinfoil Guide to EMFs. We'll be back shortly. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. The largest syndicated alternative health talk program has come to the Voice America Network. The Dr. Bob Martin Show is the program that will answer your health questions and help you to heal your own body of many different ailments. Each week, you'll hear the answers that Dr. Bob gives to his callers that help them to be their own doctor most of the time. We'll also discuss developments on the health care front and what you need to do to keep your body in top form. The Dr. Bob Martin Show airs Wednesday mornings at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health & Wellness. 
The Voice America Live Events Channel is here now to showcase your corporate, individual, or organization's live event. Visit voiceamerica.com forward slash live events to see all of our past live events and find out more. Whether it's a multi-day conference, special speaker, or single day event, we've got everything to make your event a success. We can do a few hours or a few days. For more information about taking your event to the next level, call Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or email info at voiceamerica.com. Again, that's Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or send us an email to info at voiceamerica.com. Voice America is where you are and where you want to be. Join us around the globe as we broadcast live from some of the most interesting events available. Don't forget to view all our live events, including on-demand access to past events that you may have missed by visiting voiceamerica.com forward slash live events. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Nicholas Pinot, and we're discussing his book, The Non-Tinfoil Guide to EMFs. So, Nick, before the break, you mentioned the 5G network is about to spring up. What is that? So, 5G is the fifth generation of networks. So, uh, when we had the 2G networks, it was kind of the the dumb phones, if you want. So, we we just could uh, talk on the phone, but not do much else. The 3G networks came out in the early 2000s, and then after that, we had the 4G networks that were even faster, and we, you could go online in about three times the speed of 4G. Now, the next generation is 5G, and the, the big difference is the amount of cell phone towers that are going to be required, because this is a very high-speed technology, but with very short distance. So in residential areas, we're talking about about one new uh, antenna every three to 12 homes. And in uh, downtown areas, there's going to be likely several antennas every block on traffic life signs, on uh, different poles, different uh, uh, buildings, side of the buildings, where, wherever it can fit without being too ugly is basically anything goes at this point. And the problem is proximity again, because the more, uh, the closer you are to a source, generally the higher exposure. So the, the big concern is, again, this technology is being rolled out following the same outdated idea that uh, only thermal effects matter. And, and this is on this false, uh, false premise of safety that we're going to, again, increase the speed, the convenience, and that's good. Users are excited about that. I mean, I'd be excited about that if it weren't my concerns over, uh, over health. But at the same time, we're increasing this background level of EMFs tremendously. Okay, so in in the first break, you you mentioned a little bit about what this is doing to us, but I I want to talk about what you meant by it because I I know that just saying DNA damage or mitochondrial dysfunction is going to um, confuse a lot of people. So sure. wh- what what does that mean to to us as a user? What damage will happen? <laughs> Sure. Well, it, it is. I think that the term uh, premature uh, premature uh, aging is 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 really the best way to describe it. Because on a cellular level, you get more oxidative stress. So, in other words, your 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 biology is always uh, busy fighting this this oxidation. Imagine just stress on a cellular level. And as a result, you, some people uh, are just getting older faster, so to speak. And the, the effect that they're seeing as far as symptoms go, some people report, for example, sleep disturbance. And that would be the number one thing where people sleep with their cell phone or maybe with the uh, dozens of Wi-Fi routers around, and they just don't produce enough melatonin, and they have a hard time getting into deep sleep. Some people feel fatigue or even headaches. So there are s- some symptoms that people feel, but overall is just a reduction, an overall reduction in health when where you spend a lot of time 
in the high EMF environment. And uh, a big realization when you get outside, and let's say you go by the countryside, you go camping a couple of nights, and you see a, a huge improvement in your energy levels, Part of the reason is that you don't have this stress anymore because you're not in this electrosmog anymore. So um, w- one thing that you mentioned, which um, I, I really enjoyed, was about um, Lyme. And you actually talked um, about Dietrich Klinghart, Dr. Dietrich Klinghart, who was on the show last year. Yes. And I know he talks a lot about this in, in relationship to illness, but in other things as well. I think he's very concerned about it. Can you just tell us what what's happening with with that. Sure. Uh, so Dr. Dr. Klinghart is really a pioneer in the treatment of uh, uh, treating chronic diseases. And he, he has uh, multiple practices around the world. He's roaming in, in Europe, always staying at the cutting edge. And one of them is in North America in the Washington state. It's called the Sophia Health Institute. And what Dr. Klinghart has realized for, honestly, for decades now is that if you put patients, uh, chronic Lyme being one of these cases that, that he's seeing, but also people who have neurological diseases of all kinds, uh, MS, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, really, really difficult cases where people are chronically disabled. Uh, He sees amazing results when reducing these EMFs, especially in the bedroom. And the main reason is probably multiple prong, right? It's it's, uh, an improvement in sleep. So if you improve sleep, you improve every marker of health. And we know that a sleep disturbance, even just a couple of nights, makes your, your brain function go, go south, makes your blood sugar shoot up, uh, makes uh, your, your detoxification ability uh, go down. So it, it, if it's just sleep, it could be enough to, to grant or uh, actually to have every doctor kind of recommend that to their patients, I would think. Uh, but it goes a, a little bit more than that because the EMF seems to also um, have an immune suppressing effect. And according to Dr. Klinghart, it's, it's one of the main mechanisms that explains why uh, when it comes to fighting Lyme disease, you want to reduce these EMFs in the home and your personal use of wireless devices uh, to try to fight the, 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 the Lyme infection, uh, which is simply not going away because uh, in, in a lot of people's cases, it lasts for years and it becomes chronic. It becomes something that's uh, quote unquote uncurable, but he, he does see people improve tremendously when he reduces these EMFs. And, and let's face it, when you reduce EMFs, what you're essentially doing is trying to go to back to ancestral practices. And, and I think uh, we live in the modern world. We shouldn't go just uh, hide in a cave and uh, and stop all technologies. However, studying our ancestors gives us some clues on what is compatible with with our human biology. I think, if I may put it in very simple terms. Uh, so, for example, natural food, right? Well, it works. <laughs> something that's grown from the soil, if you have something in, in your uh, that, that you grow by yourself. Now the research on microbiome and so many emer- emerging sciences is showing, okay, here's why natural food is better than processed food uh, grown in a Petri dish. That's because of the microbiome and uh, how they unlock certain nutrients and things like that. So when you're removing EMFs, essentially you're trying to go back to ancestral levels of EMFs. It just makes sense. We've, this is how our body has evolved. Since, uh, since the dawn of time. So this is what Dr. Klinghart and other, even other Lyme doctors and other practitioners uh, throughout the world are, are seeing that um, this reduction in EMFs, especially at night, simply leads to more natural healing ability for uh, almost any, uh, any illness out there. Well, and it's not like we need the internet when we're sleeping anyway. So <laughs> I, well, I think it, sure. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of useless. And who needs your phone pinging on, on all the time when getting a text or a, an email like that's just going to disturb your sleep anyway. But we don't need that on. Sure. Um, now, one thing I know that we've talked about for years with cell phones when they first came out as well is that they're going to cause cancer. Is that the case? Yeah. Well, it, it is controversial for sure. Uh, certain researchers are saying that's uh, yes, that's a definite yes. For example, Leonard Hardell from, from Sweden, who has seen a uh, uh, 500% uh, or a fivefold increase in uh, brain cancer risks when, uh, when uh, in adults when they use cell phones before age 20. 
uh, that, that's his professional uh, opinion. Hardell, the Hardell group has been studying the question for decades now, and uh, he has been one of the first uh, people who has identified Agent Orange as a carcinogen. Um, so he's a pioneer in, in these kind of studies. Now he's focused on EMF, and he's seeing that. Well, that's one voice. Uh, when you look at the overall data, uh, the problem that some people have uh, with, with the cancer, the brain cancer risk from cell phone use is the fact that overall brain cancer doesn't seem to be increasing. And, and that's true. Uh, so how, how can it be that it's not increasing if all these new users are, are using their cell phone and two decades ago, no one was basically, or just a couple of businessmen with the huge phones. Like I remember my dad, I had this, uh, this four pound phone <laughs> stuck somewhere in his, in his car that was like a Nokia 9000 in, in maybe 1996. Well, no one was using a cell phone almost uh, in that time. But when you look at where uh, where the tumors are located, there is an increase in certain tumors of the head that could be related to cell phone use. And, and we're seeing a tremendous increase. For example, acoustic neuromas, that is a benign tumor that can lead to many complications, and that can be deadly in certain situations. Uh, parotid gland uh, tumors, thyroid gland tumors. So all these, these tumors or even uh, the, uh, the glioblastoma is one of the most, uh, the deadliest um, cancers of the head is also increasing. And all of these are situated, if you will, where people talk. And, in, and something that goes and reinforces this is the fact that uh, ipsilateral cancers are increasing. So in many studies, ipsilateral main, me, uh, simply means the same uh, side of the head where a cell phone was used, you see a tumor. So there is a stronger correlation on where people use their phone. So if they're left-handed, they use it on the left, you see more cancer risk on the left, and the, the opposite is true on the right side. So it, it, this is really what, what has been seen so far. And in 2011, as, as I told you uh, um, before the, the, the last break, it's a class 2B carcinogen since 2011. But now a lot of people are saying we should have a reclassification at 2A or 1, which, is, which would be in that case uh, class 1 carcinogen. There's a huge U.S. study just two weeks ago that was published called the National Toxicology Program NTP study. And the U.S. taxpayers basically invested 25 million dollars to produce what was it, what is essentially one of the most um, uh, the, the most important as far as time and money invested when it, it comes to studying the effects of EMFs on rats uh, and from basically the equivalent of cell phone use and what they have found and the report just came out after uh, basically a, a, a two decade saga is that there is a clear evidence, and that's the highest degree of evidence available at the NTP, which is in itself the golden standard of carcinogenicity uh, science, uh, they said there's a clear evidence of heart schwannoma. So it's a type of uh, rare heart tumors that uh, principally attack the myelin sheet, the Schwann cells on the insulation of the nerves. Uh, and also, uh, this study has found uh, different levels of uh, evidence for uh, increased tumors of uh, the brain, of the adrenal glands, reduced birth weight, uh, increased DNA damage, and also other effects that normally should not have been seen because, again, the, the levels that these rats were exposed to are equivalent to what users are being exposed to. Uh, on an everyday basis. So that, that comes and reinforces the cancer uh, evidence uh, when using cell phones. And I think that, uh, again, this has been uh, published and, and right, right away the FDA who originally mandated the study in 1999 said, well, we cannot really uh, apply this to cell phone users. And they, they came with a, a strong PR response that I, I don't think is, is credible. I don't, I don't think that they did, they did a good job. And I think they're trying to, um, to sweep this under the rug. Uh, and, and unfortunately, the news has not been reported that much when you look at the importance of this study.
Well, and it, it does feel like if you if you talk about it, you're one of the crazy hippie people that believes in UFOs, yeah. um, which is why the title of your book, the Non Tinfoil Guide, um, because it is it is legitimate. But you sound you sound crazy when you talk about EMS as an issue, and that's kind of the way sure. things are are said, right? I, that's how I feel anyway. That um, you know you talk about this, and people are like, "What are you, what are you talking about? It doesn't seem to be an issue." But you're saying, I mean, there's tons of of science behind. It and we do need something to be safer here. Yes, it's it's all, it's always a question of if you look at the science that's available at the moment. Uh, are you are you on the safe side and taking precautions? Which is my for my own health, it's always been like that. Uh, I will not wait on a double blind, placebo controlled clinical trial on the use of chamomile tea in order to calm me down at night. Yesterday, I had a chamomile tea. I felt calmer and I slept soundly. I don't need a a study to tell me that. So sometimes you don't have to wait for for science to to tell you something. And when it comes to to risks, it's also the same thing. Uh, Is there there a study on every pesticide that's ever been used and their effect long-term? The answer is no. A lot of uh, chemicals are unregulated. And I think it makes sense to try to reduce our pesticide exposure because, of course, a pesticide is not a vitamin. It's not going to make you healthier. So on, on, on the same, with the same idea when it comes to EMS, it's, it's about reducing exposure, reducing time of use, not sleeping with a freaking cell phone under the, the pillow because <laughs> it's definitely not going to improve your sleep. And, mm-hmm. and chances are that it will disrupt it. And then when you ask the people on, on the forefront of the issue, not, not the researchers who are in a lab trying to, uh, to work on theories and, and, or study populations that have been uh, uh, damaged from something, uh, and that's called epidemiology, studying the past in order to not repeat future mistakes. When you look at clinical setting, Dr. Klinghart, but also the top doctors in, in functional medicine, Dr. Zach Bush, Dr. Dan Pompa, the, the, I, I, can, I, can, I can name them all day. A lot of these doctors are claiming that they're seeing these cases of people getting sick from EMF, uh, having these EMF-related symptoms. And then they're also claiming and seeing on a clinical standpoint that when you reduce these EMFs, People feel better, they feel better, and they sleep better. So this is enough evidence for me to say, okay, we should probably reduce exposure. We should probably turn off the Wi-Fi at night. We should probably reduce cell phone use to the head because the studies, it looks like the more time goes by, the more studies on brain cancer are being published. And and I want people to protect themselves now and, and the worst thing that can happen is that we all protected ourselves for nothing because it ends up being completely fine, which I don't think it will happen because right. of, of where science is going. It is going in a direction where every year it looks a little bit, the portrait looks a little bit worse and people are exposing themselves more. So it, it's just, uh, I, guess, I guess I'm just someone who wants to act uh, in, in face uh, of uncertainty and of course, some people are going to say, well, this is a message of fear mongering and whatnot, but it, it, this is not the message. I, I, I never claimed, and in the book, I, I tried to be as balanced as possible. This is not the, the root cause of every illness or the only thing that matters or a huge conspiracy against humanity. It, it, in my mind, it's a problem of technology, a problem of uh, putting profits first. And, and, and then users can protect themselves while we argue on a scientific standpoint, should we, stand the safe, uh, should we change the safety standards? Should we warn users? Should we shield these devices? All these questions are not questions that the population should, should be answering. It should be the, the government, it should be the industry. And in the meantime, everyone can reduce exposure and it doesn't cost al- almost zero dollars so, to reduce your exposure tremendously. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you there. We're going to take a quick break and when we come back we're going to talk about what people can do to protect themselves so we're talking today with nicholas pano and we're discussing his book the non-tinfoil guide to emfs and we'll be back shortly opinions options answers you're listening to voice america health and wellness 
us on the go. It's even easier now. The Voice America Talk Radio Network has a mobile app for iOS, Android, or Amazon Kindle. Visit the Apple App Store, Amazon, or Google Play to download the app powered by Aircast. It's free and no registration is necessary. In minutes, you could be enjoying your favorite Voice America Talk Radio host no matter where you are, in the car, out and about, while traveling, or anytime you can't be close to your computer. Catch up on the archives you've missed or discover new shows on the spot. Search Voice America at your favorite app store. What causes us to be sick? We're not talking about the actual illness or the scientific cause of illnesses. We're talking about your body and health. Listen for the healing whisper of Return to Peace. Each week, host Dr. Marianne Chase shows you how to listen to your heart to identify poor health, stress, and disease. You'll learn how to heal energetically and spiritually as well as physically. It's time to depend less on the drugs and more on the heart. The Healing Whisper airs live every Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health & Wellness. We're on the pulse of the world with great shows and hosts. The Voice America Health & Wellness Channel is also on Twitter. We've got ideas to keep you healthy, breaking health news, and more. Follow us on Twitter at Voice AM Health. That's at Voice AM Health. Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health and Wellness. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Riss. To reach the program today, please call in to 1 866 472 5792. Again, that's 1 866 472 5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. We're uh, talking today with Nicholas Pinot, and we're discussing his book, The Non-Tinfoil Guide to EMS. So, so Nick, um, we've talked about what th- what these things are doing to us and, um, you know, what they are, but what can we do to protect ourselves until there is more government protection for us and the technology changes? Sure. The number one source uh, most people are exposed to when it comes to EMFs is their own devices. The own thing, the, the, your own things that you pay about uh, more than thousand dollars for the latest iPhone. That, that's that's the main source of EMF. So it's a matter of creating distance because the inverse square law tells us that the signal strength drops off with the square root of the distance. So if you uh, just just create a one foot distance between the phone and your head, you're essentially re- reducing the, the risks and the signals by 80%, uh, 90% drop off at two feet. So people who use earbuds, the speakerphone, it's way safer than on using it on the ear. And, and right there, if, if there were a, a, a final and definitive answer when it comes to brain cancer, well, you would not likely get the, the same risks at uh, 80% drop off of the signal, if any. So it's very important to simply create this distance. And this goes with an iPad, an iPhone, or, or the equivalent in any brand, right? Any wireless device, and also the laptop. And that's not the most convenient thing for me to say because a lot of people use a laptop on their lap, but the effects that are seen uh, are not good. And if the effects of these EMFs on the head are true, end up being true when it comes to brain cancer, well, you don't want cancer in another place of your body or these risks to, to be in, in, in another place of body and you're growing a rear, for example. So creating distance is key. Uh, the, the second thing that you can do and that you should do is really clean up your bedroom because this is where sleep happens and where uh, the, these EMFs are the most likely going to disrupt your, your health because of the, the sleep dis- disturbance effect. So your phone can be on airplane mode. It will essentially uh, reduce all the EMFs that would otherwise be emitted 24, uh, 24-7, essentially. Even if you don't play on your phone, you're not doing Instagram or anything, uh, your phone every couple seconds or every uh, minute is connecting back to the tower just to send a little bit of data to verify if it's still connected. And this will emot- emit a pulse and it, w- it will also uh, potentially uh, disturb your sleep. So cell phones on airplane mode and also reduce your use. I see a lot of people nowadays have about 10 different devices that can be wireless in their bedroom. The iPad is charging, but it's still open on Wi-Fi. 
the laptop is charging, still open on Wi-Fi, there's a Bluetooth thermostat, there's everything Bluetooth. Well, if you reduce these sources, again, uh, just like you would re try to reduce your use of um, certain uh, materials that are known to be more toxic, or it, it's a matter of reducing the amount of sources that you have, especially in the bedroom. And most people who follow this advice that, that I give them, or that practitioners who, who know about these risks uh, give them, uh, they, re they realize quickly that they sleep better. So right there, it's an improvement. You don't have to take a pill. You just need to reduce uh, and unplug a couple of things from your bedroom. Uh, and the third thing I would say is that when it comes to children, we don't know exactly what the long-term consequences are, but uh, they're worrying because if anything that uh, science is finding at the moment when it comes to adults is true, uh, children are more likely to absorb this radiation. In fact, they, they absorb at least twice the radiation compared to adults pound per pound, and a cell phone signal can go all the way uh, to the other side of their brain compared to about an inch or two in an adult because their skull is, is thinner and their head is smaller. And the, our technology, our safety standards are not, are not tested on children or on, a, on the equivalent model of a children. And if they were, I don't think that these devices would be deemed safe. And that's, very, uh, that's an issue that I think is long overdue because even if the industry can claim, well, our devices are not made for children, well, in one survey in 2014 from the American uh, Academy for Pediatrics, and uh, in, in that was in a Philadelphia neighborhood, it was in fact 75% of four-year-olds had a cell phone. And, and that's probably for safety reasons, right? Uh, parents don't know better, and it, it's, it's great that they have it in case of emergency, but probably should not be used on the head, uh, especially when they're so small. So that's another big concern. So what I would advise for all parents who hand their cell phone or an iPad or, or uh, any kind of wireless device to a, ch to a child, put it on airplane mode. And you can download apps that can be played offline. You can download movies beforehand and then and, uh, a tablet or iPad and have your, your child reduce their risks associated with this technology because you will have put airplane mode, this safeguard of airplane mode beforehand. Well, I know one thing I I did um, after doing a show um, about the social aspect of um, phones, um, not not the health aspect. Um, I got an app mm -hmm. that that calculates the hours I spend on my on my phone and iPad, and so that way I'm able to to notice if I'm going overboard with exposure, um, spending too much time on it, and and I mean really if you're if you're playing a game or you're on social media, you're not really doing anything productive. So I I think that's really important. In any way, <laughs> you know, for other reasons, that's not true, just our true. exposure, but really, do we need to be doing that? Shouldn't we go and reach out to somebody and call them on speakerphone instead of putting the phone to our ear and have more connection? So, uh, so I think overall, this will will help people to do that. I mean, we don't need to be glued to our phones and and having um, this technology instead of you know a real life, really. That's true. And uh, when it comes to reduction, I, I also haven't mentioned something that is essentially the biggest exposure that people get at home is oftentimes their own Wi-Fi router. So just turning off the Wi-Fi at night, for example, you could purchase a, a, a 5 to $7 uh, Christmas light timer and a lot of people will, will have them already for, the, for, for their Christmas tree. Uh, and well, you can plug your Wi-Fi router inside this timer and uh, automatically make it turn off between the hours that you please, 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. And just make sure that the entire the entire household that isn't getting exposed to these signals. And most people also report better sleep when they turn off their Wi-Fi. And a lot of people tell me, "Well, Nick, <laughs> that's good. I just turned off my Wi-Fi, but I I can uh, see that there's about." 150 other networks just from my neighbors. Well, that's true, but the biggest exposure is the one Wi-Fi router that's closest to your body, and chances are that it's your own Wi-Fi router that's a problem. So installing it in a remote area of the home is, is preferable to, uh, to it being close to bedrooms or living areas, and then turning it off at night or even turning it off when it's not in use. And 
uh, you would be surprised how many people you barely use their Wi-Fi during the day. Maybe they're a uh, stay-at-home mom taking care of kids, and no one is using the Wi-Fi, but it's, it's there. It is, it is filling the environment, and if you want to reduce your risk, you might as well just open the Wi-Fi when you need it. Or even better, which is something I do at home now with my little uh, Elliot, who's six months old, I decided to not have Wi-Fi, and we, have, we still have the Internet, right? but it's called an Ethernet cable. And this is mm-hmm. how everyone used to use the Internet, through a cable. And, of course, it's a little bit more hassle, but once you, uh, you do your home uh, rewiring or, or, or you just uh, use, use a wire from the router to your computer, well, you have zero radiation, uh, and you still have, well, in fact, you have a better connection because my, I, as you mentioned at the beginning before we started, my connection is 100%. Well, yeah, I'm on Ethernet cable, so there's no fluctuation in the signal, and it's, it's faster, it's more stable, it's more secure. So it's always something to also consider, especially for people who have a, an office or people who have a home office and their computer is is not going to move around, you might as well just have it plugged in. There's really no reason to be on Wi-Fi except convenience, of course. But uh, something mm-hmm. I, as, uh, I say all the time, if you want convenience, you can eat McDonald's or uh, Arby's. or I mean, you can, you can eat junk food all the time, right? That's convenience. But we know that convenience sometimes doesn't lead to best health. Convenience is just watching TV and, and not moving your body. But again, it doesn't mean to the best health that, that you could have or, or even happiness. So it's a matter of reducing convenience a little bit, uh, not to the extent that uh, you, you feel like you're depriving yourself and, and, and going to worry over, over worry about it, but it's reducing exposure to the point you feel comfortable and taking these baby steps to reduce your exposure. Well, and if you're following the advice of not having your laptop on your lap, it's going to sit on a desk or a table of some sort. So then you can set up your Ethernet near there and plug it in. And if you do want the wireless, um, you can put that timer on. And I think you're just, I mean, that's 50% of your exposure if you're reducing it while you're you're sleeping or even just during the day if you're at home and not using it and doing something else. You don't need that on. You're right. It's, it's, we're overdoing it for sure. It's true. It, it's a matter, you know, something I, I share often in these interviews is that we, we should uh, switch around the way we use technology. And what I mean by that is that uh, our technology is always on and sometimes off, like turning it off at night. It should be the opposite. It should be always off and sometimes on. So turn on, turn on your Wi-Fi when you need it. Turn on your cell phone when you need it. And instead of always being 24-7 connected, uh, a lot of people have, even when it comes to just being connected, you, you mentioned it, being on social media, kind of having a, a set period in the morning to go on social media and trying to turn it off after night, uh, afterwards to be more productive for your day. Most people feel better when they do that, but it does have uh, an addictive appeal, this technology, and a lot of people are kind of just glued to their their phone trying to refresh the email inbox every minute and we all know that's not something good but it it has addictive properties that make it very very hard to to apply this um this discipline to it pretty much like it is hard not to go and eat junk food if you're hungry and and you haven't planned anything for 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 dinner so it's it, but if you start changing your habits having great food at home in the fridge, learning how to cook a little bit more, then it becomes easier. So when it comes to EMFs, it's the same thing. It's having this, uh, this, uh, this habit of putting your phone on airplane mode if you're to, to put it in your pocket, uh, of changing the way your, your, your home office or your, your office is set up, uh, and just going from there. It's all a matter of changing how you use uh, technology. Well, that that's perfect, and I think a, a perfect way to end the show. Now, if if anybody wants more information, your book is full of great stuff. Um, how can they get a hold of you or your book? Sure, um, you can uh, you can look for my name on Google. You'll find my Facebook page and uh, YouTube. It's uh, Pino P I N E A U L T. So Nick Pino. And EMFs, you'll, you'll, you'll find a lot of information that I share for free. And the book, The Non-Tinfoil Guide to EMFs, is on uh, all great Amazon stores in hard copy and also the Kindle format. 
Well, uh, <laughs> it, it, when you're using it on the Kindle, turn off your uh, your Wi-Fi yeah, connection. Yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, the, sorry the irony that it's uh, this is our, our our world now, right? And we just, as you yeah. said, have to have to reduce what we're doing. Um, so, thank you so much for for joining me today. I, I really enjoyed this topic, and I'm I'm glad that you're sharing this information and we're getting this um, out there for people. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for spreading the word and thank everyone for for listening to this message today. Um, So today we were talking with Nicholas Pinot and then his book was called The Non-Tinfoil Guide to EMFs. If you want more information about my story, you can uh, find that on my blog site at dr-risk.com. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. You can send me a email at anantacalgary at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening today and be sure to make today a great day. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Please join Dr. Rebecca Risk again next Monday at noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We'll talk more next week. 